And we are live. Wow. Hello, everyone, and welcome um, to this uh, first webinar uh, of uh, 2023. Um, today's topic is the social care need a new culture of employee recognition. And today I am joined by Neil Eastwood and Adam Pernell. Uh, Neil Eastwood is the founder and CEO of CareFriends. CareFriends is an employee referral app for social care employers and operate in the partnership with Skills for Care. It uses gamification to grow the workforces using personal recommendation of their trusted staff. Neil is also the founder of Sticky People. I love that name, by the way. Uh, a provider of tools and advice to support social care and healthcare employers, including um, the Sticky People psychometric screening tool for social care and healthcare recruitment. So huge welcome to you, Neil. Um, Adam is the director of, uh, of social care for the Institute of Health and Social Care Management. He is also the host of the amazing social care-led uh, talk show, The Caring View, which uh, discusses and celebrates all things social care and is available on YouTube, LinkedIn, and podcast. I've been so lucky to be uh, have been invited on that podcast, and it is good, good fun, but also very informative, so highly recommend that. My name is Oli Johnson, and I am the co-founder of Sona. Sona is building the uh, frontline operating system or operating system for the frontline workforce, and we're highly focused on the social care sector. Um, right, before we kick off, uh, I've been told to go through some housekeeping rules. Um, so firstly, all opinions made on this webinar uh, are the speaker's own opinions. Uh, there will be a Q&A session at the end, so please use the questions tab for asking questions. You can upload the questions uh, that you like and they will uh, be answered first, or we'll try to see them answered first. Um, the webinar is recorded uh, and we will be sending uh, uh, kind of an on-demand on version after the webinar to everyone that has registered. And so also, if you know someone that didn't make it today, uh, but would be interested, please share the link with them as well. Um, follow us on LinkedIn to be the first to know about our February event uh, and the release of uh, some incredible resources linked to this event. Keep an eye out for our post-event email as well, uh, where you'll be able to have your say if you believe the social care does need a new culture of recognition or not. And finally, if you haven't done so already, I highly recommend that you check out uh, Sona's latest report, um, Appreciation Matters, which deep dives into some of the uh, topics that we will be discussing here today. And with that, I think we can kick off the program more formally. Welcome to you both, Adam and Neil. How are you doing, uh, Neil, if I, if I start with you? Yeah, super good. Uh, I am off to Australia on Friday, so I'm just packing my flip-flops. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's all good here. What? What's the what's the temperature like in Australia? And where are you going in Australia? I think thirty-seven, uh, and Brisbane. Oh, oh sorry, I'm yeah. probably being okay. hated by everybody now, so I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it's for work, so uh, I'm <laughs> amazing. What about you, Adam? Are you going somewhere sunny, or are you uh, you're, you're staying here? In, in, well, in, I'm in... I'm packing. You know, I, I think I qualify as to say that I'm packing, but mine's just to move house, unfortunately, not to go to sunny Brisbane in Australia for work. I, I, I love one of those jobs where I can just travel the country. Oh, it's for work, you know, it's for work. I'm teasing, Neil, I'm teasing. Uh, no, I'm good. Thank you very much, Ollie. It's uh, been a pleasant start to the new year. Amazing. Right. I, uh, I mean, I'm going to put this question to the audience as well, but I'd love to kick off with a, a, an informal temperature check. Um, and so maybe I'll start with you, Adam. You guys do a, a good job. Um, when was the last time uh, you were praised by a colleague for your work? curious so I'm, I'm really lucky um i get um recognition quite a bit at the institute we're a small team at the institute and i'm quite high up in, in my position there but the ceo you know is is very keen on on recognition there and then within the caring view it is just mark and i you know we are the the sole team of the caring view and we are constantly supporting each other we're a close network there and so I, I feel very lucky. Prior to that, I was a registered manager. Um, and I will say that I was lucky there as well. You know, me and my proprietor were on speaking terms. We worked together every single day. So the recognition was there um, for myself. So I've, I've got a good history with with um, sort of being recognized for the work that I do. That's amazing. And by the way, to everyone uh, on, on the webinar, you can participate yourself on the poll. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's in the, in the lower right corner of your screen. So please answer the question as well so we can get some uh, statistics, statistics for everyone and I'll share them uh, as we kind of continue. But over to you, Neil. Uh, what about you? Yeah, so well, the, 
uh, whole of Care Friends, apart from me, is uh, female. And so I get <laughs> actually do get quite a lot of praise um, just for like basically turning up. They seem really amazed. Um, so, so, yeah, it's a really nice t team. There's 16 of us. Um, and uh, but often I'm doing external facing things. So yesterday I did a NHS uh, retention uh, webinar and they were very grateful because it's all this culture of caring, you know, so uh, I'm I'm super lucky like Adam. that, uh, And I think, you know, we forget for those of us that have can remember working outside the sector, it's actually not as nice. And so there is, the, you know, and we'll talk about that. I think there's a lot of love, you know, there's a lot of this attracts a certain kind of people so it's a really it's a privilege to work in it even though i'm no longer a provider i used to have uh, ten thousand staff uh, about 13 years ago but now not uh, only 16 so okay yeah. you know that's amazing um just looking uh, and reflecting on on the numbers that are coming in through the poll by the looks of it like people were kind of and I, I agree with you that that i think within the, the care sector it is um it's probably better than in a lot of sectors. So even if we are talking about, about uh, you know, cultural recognition and improvements on, on that front, I think there, there seems to be, uh, certainly by the looks of the poll, um, very few people answer the poll that they uh, can't remember when they were actually last praised. So I think, uh, I mean, not that that's a very high bar to clear, but uh, it's good to see that that is indeed a bar that, that most people end up clearing. And quite a few actually uh, say uh, either in the, in the uh, last week, so... Uh, a third says in the last week, a third says in um, the last month or so. And then there's an even split almost between kind of how many people were praised today or actually can't remember. So, and I think that's that's largely kind of reflective of, of what, we, what we've seen. It's good that um, people are getting uh, recognized and praised by, by their colleagues. Um, but, um, you know, maybe we, we could do better as well. Um, switching gear a little bit. So starting with you, uh, Neil, do you think, um that we need a new culture of recognition in social care yeah I it's interesting i mean i think the you know a lot of people are doing their best what's happened with the pressures and probably the pressures like even worse after covid if that is actually a term you can use is that as the pressure has increased and there are more things to do and there are more trackers to fill in and there are more you know things to keep in touch with and CQC is issuing stuff and this pressure the thing that loses out is that moment of saying well done to somebody because you become task orientated and I think we've underestimated that we've lost a lot of the glue that keeps people coming into social care so I think there are reasons that create job dissatisfaction and that might be things like low pay kind of those hygiene factors but mm -hmm. but any amount of pay is not going to attract you to do this work it's something else it's this psychological pull and I think and so we have these caring people people describe themselves having calling for care and they are um they they feed off appreciation and uh and and because they they've chosen this job regardless of the money almost and i think as as it's got more difficult and pressured for managers so those quiet words of well done and thanks and we'll talk about the differences between appreciation and recognition perhaps as we go through but i think that's been a real shame i think i, I think the i wouldn't criticize the sector at all for saying there isn't enough of it i think it's the structural problems that have created so much pressure particularly on managers and supervisors and often say we would promote a supervisor we did this in my home care business we promoted mm. uh, someone from a care worker to a supervisor gave them no training around mm. soft skills conflict resolution blame free language active listening you know we missed the whole relationship piece so i think the answer a short answer is yes but it's it's a, there's some of this stuff is structural, but I think there are things as we'll talk and Adam, I'm sure has got some great ideas about how we can kind of bake in the bit that's missing. Yeah, that's super interesting. What do you think, Adam? Over to you. Well, I mean, it, you, you know, you'd be daft not to agree with the fact that there's a, a recognition um, problem in social care, be that, you know, for, for our employees that work in organizations. But I think we need to look at the wider picture when we think of recognition as well, because we always talk about leadership being top down. We always talk about how, you know, we learn from our leaders at the top and that sort of behavior is learned and it transcends the ranks. We do need to look at things like our regulator, our government, our director of health and social care, because 
if we don't get the recognition from third party sources or from our outsources, even the people we're supporting, if we work in an organization that doesn't have a culture of um, positive feedback, so we're not encouraging people to, uh, you know, thank our carers or thank our teams or to provide us with what we're doing well, then that level of recognition won't be instilled within our culture and our leaders and our managers won't give it a second thought because they'll be thinking, well, actually, media haters, the public haters, the people we're supporting don't like us, the government don't do anything for us, and CQC just want to blame us. So there's there's no real sort of appetite there for, for recognition because they're not being recognised, the sector's not being recognised. So we really need to be able to recognise internally, but the whole country, the whole of society as a whole needs to start recognising social care for, for what it is. Ah, it's such a good point. So so there's the, the need for, for things to be like, for recognition to to be internally so managers recognizing recognizing their their subordinates but also colleagues recognizing each other but that in and of itself is not enough it has to kind of come uh, from outside in as well and that has to be led by a kind of higher level of, of so on a, a national or, or local government level that is that kind of a fair summary of of, of that yeah, I mean, let's, you know, let's put it this way. So all of last year, we were being drummed up that the single assessment framework is coming in this year. The single assessment framework from CQC is coming. It's coming at the beginning of the year. So providers are madly trying to learn what this is, coming through a pandemic, trying to fill their beds, being told that the NHS crisis is all their fault. And actually, it's not coming till at least the end of this year, probably beginning of next year. But that's not been communicated to the people delivering the care. So if we can't even respect and value our, our sector enough to tell them what's going to happen within their own validation and, and, you know, legal recognition, our inspections, then how can we expect anybody to recognise and, and, and thank themselves and appreciate themselves if we just can't do that ourselves? We, we owe them that, that, that truth, that candour. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that, that, that I can, could agree more uh... Yeah, to totally agree with that. It's interesting to me, just uh, reflecting a little bit on, on kind of internal recognition. Um, I think, Neil, you said that, that it's, it's a calling uh, working in, in social care. Uh, it is, it is it's more than just a job, more than just a hard job. It's a, it's a vocation. Um, and people do it uh, despite the low pay. There's high stress and there's lack of flexibility, which I think especially kind of after, after the kind of years of pandemic, uh, where uh, flexibility was gained by certain certain areas of of the workforce, but but not others, it becomes more and more important to to kind of do certain things that make a difference for the the, the care sector, the social care sector, um, and that is on one hand that is I think uh, needs to come from the government, as, as both you and and uh, Neil and Adam have highlighted. But I also just like reflecting on it when we talk about things that that could benefit our workforce. Oftentimes, there are things that cost money or, and resources and are very difficult to implement. Um, and changing your behavior, uh, either on a kind of inside an organization to be more uh, focused on, on giving praise, but also in particular, um, our, our government uh, looking to the sector and being more outwardly praise, praising and, and, and supportive, I think, would go a long way. Uh, especially in, in, these, in these hard times where, where things like flexibility and pay and other things aren't being met. Um, those things that, that come with an actual cost figure or, or, or people at least can uh, reflect on it coming with a, with a cost figure. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree with, agree with what you said more. Um, what do you, what do you uh, see as some of the um, um, benefits of, 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 of kind of appreciation? Why should, why should organizations themselves, uh, but also I just want to extend it as, as well, given kind of where we took, took this in, in the beginning, um, like where should, you know, where should government be thinking about, about this? Why, why is this an important topic for either organizations or, or government? Maybe I'll start with you this time, Adam. Well, I mean, the simple and blunt answer is, do you want to remain viable and have a business? You know, that's that's the, the, the top and tail of it. You know, if we look at the social care data that came from the Skills for Care's most recent report, the fact that we've got a 29% turnover currently in social care, yes, okay, we're retaining almost half of them within the sector. But if you think 29% of your business just could up and leave tomorrow because you're not recognising them and, and thanking them, then I, it's a simple thing. I mean, I would start with saying, you know, if you want to be a decent person, recognise them, it's yeah. important. Yeah. You know, it's just about loving thy neighbour, you know, not to make it um, religious or political or anything, what your beliefs are, love thy neighbour, treat people with respect so that they don't feel like 
a spare part within within the system. So it's about making sure that you can retain your team to operate your business and provide the care and support that you need. With that comes a ton of caveats, and I'm sure we'll go into you know sort of the the reasons that you need to think of if you are recognising people. One, for example, if you're recognizing your team and it's brilliant and, you know, your turnover's increasing, your profit's increasing, not your turnover, your profit's increasing, and you go to your team at the end of the year, we've done really good this year, profit's gone up by £400,000, uh, thank you, then we can sit here and go, <laughs> thank you, cost nothing, but if your profit's increasing, share the wealth, because mm. they're the people that have lined your pockets, so there's a lot to do with recognition but it really is just about making sure that that one individual person and you look at them as an individual person feels comfortable loved respected and safe within their working environment it's it's as simple as that yeah perfect what about you neil what do you think yeah i think anna makes a really good point and um if you look at pay which is a kind of touchstone isn't it for a lot of this sort of you know retention and I was in a taxi uh, a while ago going to a conference and the taxi driver said to me, oh, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm going to present on recruitment and retention at a social care conference. He said, oh, that's easy. Just pay him more money. I could have saved you a trip, mate. And I, and I think, you know, is he is he right? Well, he is right because because pay actually feeds into self-esteem and what the public would see is a, you know, a, a, and so does registration of care workers. But I mean, pay, we des desperately do underpay our staff. We're paying about 69% of the average hourly national wage and to say the Netherlands and other parts of Europe are close to 100%. They still have issues recruiting because I think it's a complex thing, pay, but that's a good place to start. But, uh, but given that, I don't think pay in and of itself is going to deal with the intrinsic kind of, why would I do this job? If you looked at it right now, with all of the choices that someone in care has at the moment to work in other settings, you might say, how have we got anybody? How, why is there anyone doing this job? Because rationally, there's more money and it's less emotional and physical strain elsewhere on social hours and so on. And I think the reason for that is we should we should dig into why that is. And I think there are, you know, amongst the workforce, they are very special people because they have what they would describe as a calling for care. And often they have self-esteem issues because they'll often say, I'm just a care carer and that and that's a problem because uh, not only we've we got society we've also got our own care workers who don't feel valued but i think there are these like five factors that i would see that um explain the psychological pull the hidden psychological pull of care work and and the danger for us is we're relying on them and we may be potentially exploiting those people who are so giving it's almost a spiritual thing a religious thing uh, they get emotional satisfaction. They get their self-esteem. It's a surrogate family. The bonds are very, you know, they feel a responsibility. Uh, and in some cases, you know, they see social care as a haven from their own kind of com problems at home. And and it is a family for those of us actually in, in you know care settings right now. It is a familial place. It's about the whole person. And so I think, you know, uh recognizing that is very important now you have two vectors we might talk a little bit more about that i mean i would say recognition is about people's actions and hopefully quickly saying well done and sometimes publicly some people don't want to be publicly recognized and then there's appreciation which is more about that person those factors i was talking about that it's yeah. about that person and appreciating the contribution they're making more more generally, it's more about feelings. And I think we can forget with all our kind of hard skills, soft um, sort of uh, hard skills, your training and regulations and so on, we forget the familial love bit of this. And I think this is what we're speaking to is feeding, feeding that. Yeah, that's so good. It's, um, it's interesting. I, I, we're now a few months uh, we, we call it post pandemic, but but yeah, you, you bear with me with, with using that language. But a few months um, already post pandemic, the kind of vacancy is around 10%, and the, the sector has around 35% turnover. And this is a, a sector, just so we're clear, this is a sector full with people that are passionate about, passionate about what they do. It's a vocation, as we've covered before. And I, I, it's, it's very interesting to me that you, you, you went down. down the pay route and then saying that that is not enough in, in and of itself. I think we, we all agree that pay is, it, it kind of starts with pay, doesn't it? Um, and in fact, in our research uh, that we've gone through, we've seen that pay, like it always fa uh, factors uh, factors in and uh, usually is at the very top of the pyramid. Um, it's strange to me that uh, the second biggest factor uh, being, being appreciation and, and, and praise 
um, comes at a, like at a very close second, um, but costs a lot less and is 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 rarely rarely mentioned. I think. Um, and let, let's not be let's not kid ourselves. I agree with what you said about earlier that people in this country, it's amazing that we get anyone to do this job. We should be really taking a close look at uh, what the pay structures and, and the pay levels are and start to compare ourselves uh, outwardly with the ones that are doing it much, much better um, than, than we are at this point, point in time. Um, it's interesting also just that, that, that I think I think it was you, Adam, that said just like, uh, it's like kind of love thy neighbor, but uh, almost just like giving praise should also just be, or the effect of giving praise and appreciation should just be a goal in and of itself. Just like making sure that you have happy colleagues, happy employees should be a goal in and of itself. Yes, they, they, they stay for longer. They are um, easier to, to kind of retain and recruit. Uh, they are also by the notion of being happier in the workplace, they are actually more productive. They are also make less mistakes, but they're also just happier people. And that is just in of itself uh, a worthwhile goal, I think. And it's often gets overlooked when it comes to these things. I think just just on that though, just to you know take that one step further, it's it's you know one to have the idea of being able to thank everyone, to be able to respect everyone. I will mm. say though, you need to respect yourself. You need to love yourself. Um, if you don't have self-love, if you don't have self-respect, if you don't have self-recognition, then as the gay god RuPaul says, how the heck are you going to love somebody else? And yeah. you've got to be able to start loving yourself. And that's really, really difficult. You know, how many of us will stand in front of the mirror, well, you know, me, beefy guy, and go, God, you look fat today. Now, would I go out and say that to someone? Would I go out and say that to someone's face? You know, oh, you've been lazy today. Would I go and say that to someone? Because if the answer is no, why am I saying it to myself? Yeah. Oh, you know, perfect. look inwards, reflect inwards, care inwards. And if you can love yourself, it makes thanking and recognizing and supporting others that much easier. And it actually allows you to take compliments better. Because if you can go, actually, I have done a really good job today. Thanks. You know, whereas if you don't like yourself and someone says you've done a good job, you'll go away going, oh, really? Have I? Oh, I could have done that better. And I don't really think so. So work on loving yourself as well. And it will make things so much easier. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Very much agree. Also, just like we should make sure that we pay people better as well. I just I, I don't want to gloss over that fact uh, uh, as, as kind of as part of this. That is very much, I think, something that, that this actor needs to kind of um, get to terms with and, and fix. Um, our research that I mentioned at the start of this, uh, Appreciation Matters, uh, it revealed uh, uh, a number of interesting things, one of which was that uh, around two in five employees in the sector have left a job because they didn't feel valued. Do you guys find that surprising or, or not so much? So start with you maybe this time, Neil. No, I'm not surprised at all. Uh, I think the research is really fascinating. Um, I reread it again last night. I got even more out of it. And I, I think often if you do an exit interview, people will say personal reasons. And I remember when we did exit interviews, um, you know, back in my home care days, uh, the vast majority gave that answer. And that doesn't tell you the real reason why. And they probably don't want to say to the manager that's asking them that, actually, it was you that seemed to ignore me or didn't support me. So I think there's there's certainly a lot more, um, you know, this research really speaks to uh, probably what you wouldn't hear if you were an employer asking that same research. So so I think it's really, I, I absolutely believe it. I think we're in a situation now with the cost of living crisis and so on, where obviously pay is the kind of maybe the trigger, but often you need more than one reason to leave. And um, and I think it could be often it's the lack of recognition just makes people feel like, well, why would I do this? And I think we can identify that if you have an organization, if you are a provider on the call. I think it's I like to look and say, OK, if people are leaving you, are they leaving the sector or are they going somewhere else? Are they a switcher, which is rejecting you, your organization, or are they saying I'm done with care? And you look at the yeah. mix of those and you think, hang on, everyone's left for the care home down the road. Oh, is there a common denominator yeah. here? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that, I mean, thinking back to when we had 125 branches around the country, you know, where there was a problem with a manager, for example, you would see massive rates of turnover. And if we replaced the manager, people came back. So very clearly, yeah. that's nothing to do with pay. Yeah, that's so that's so interesting. And I've seen that in, in a number of, of sectors that, that we work with, that oftentimes people are not leaving the sector that itself. It, they're exactly like you said, Neil, they're going down the road um, and the pay might be the same or, or you know, they might even be... A, 
fluctuation in pay of a, for a, a few P's here and there, but not necessarily upwards. They might be leaving for a lower paid job, but, you know, what, not wanting to go through um, working with a, a manager or colleagues that, that don't appreciate them for, for their contribution. What do you think, uh, Adam? I, I am surprised, but I'm surprised it's so low. I actually, yeah. and this is not this is not to you know dump on social care. I thought it would be higher. I thought it would be a lot, lot higher. And you know, I'm just looking through the comments as they come through at the moment. And you know, I'm not going to single people's names and, and stuff like that out. But the idea of flexibility is is quite strong within the comments section in here. And there's you know, there's comments. Well, how can we be more flexible? It's social care. It's a 24 hour role. And the amount of times I've had conversations with managers and gone, look. You want to employ people to work in your business and you'll interview people and they'll go, but actually I can only do school hours. So where's your school hour shift? Oh, no, no, we can't do that. It's eight till eight here or, or eight till two. Well, then you're instantly isolating people. Recognition doesn't have to be just going, oh, you've done a really good job. Here's a pay rise. Recognition is recognizing people's lives are different. People's needs are different. People's, you know, wants for, for working conditions are different. So change yeah. your work patterns. Have a look at how you can do it because that will get more people in through your door and it will retain more people within your organization. Have a shift that's five till nine in the morning. Target the cleaners who go and do cleaning jobs first thing because that's the only time of day they can work because they babysit the grandkids in the afternoon who probably want to come into social care, but no job offers a five till nine shift. You know, very simple things when it comes to flexibility. It's not just about different roles. But I, I, I do think a part of me worries that the retention, um, one in five leaving, would be higher if job security and the cost of living crisis and actual stability in this country was much, much better. I do feel people stay within their jobs because they feel like they've got to, they've got commitments elsewhere, they've got financial commitments, they've got debt that they need to be able to pay, they've got mortgages yeah. which are tripling at this moment in time, and I know this because I'm just going through it myself. So there's a case of, actually, I really hate my job. I hate the people I work with. I hate the people who manage me, but I can't go anywhere. I'm trapped. Yeah. They might not be anywhere else down the road. They may be rural or they may be thinking, well, actually, the grass might not be greener on the other side. So I worry there's a, a depth to that sort of question that could be explored, uh, explored further. Yeah, I think this is, uh, I mean, two things that I'd say is, is firstly, you're so right about the, the current state of, of, I guess, the, the economy and kind of cost of living crisis and, and all of those things probably play, playing into whether people have um, left a role because of, of lack of, of feeling valued. Um, to be fair, uh, the number rises from 41% to 72% when you uh, include people that have seriously considered um, moving the job. So you can see that almost, you know, you, you've added their, their 30% 30, 30 on top of, of that number. And people, for all kinds of different reasons, may not have decided to leave. You might also just be working in a, a, a you know, you, again, this is also a vocation, as we discussed before, but you also might be working in a small town, and it's going to be difficult for you to kind of stay within the, the area that you're passionate about if you, if you leave that particular employer. Another thing I would say is um, the research actually showed that um, some people care, and I think you mentioned this, Adam, some people care di differently, care, care, care more than others about, you know, getting praise and value. And um, the number actually rises from 41% uh, to 81%, um, i.e. people that have left a, a role within the sector, um, when, you, when they uh, are asked the follow-up question, which is, is praise important to you? So like 81% of people that, uh, that say that praise is important to me have left, uh, have left because of lack of, of feeling valued. And that's, I think, just rationally, that makes a ton of sense, doesn't it? That's exactly what you, you'd expect to see. Um, but it's so so interesting to see that like we, we we do value as a kind of as a species we do value being being praised but that value that um, that feeling isn't um, uniformly distributed if that makes sense. Um, switching gears a little, I I wanted to kind of make a quick poll again. I don't know whether we can get the tech people to help. Um, I wanted to check with, uh, with the audience uh, whether they feel uh, awkward about giving praise uh, and. Uh, while I kind of get the answers to that question, again, the polls are in the lower right hand corner of your screen, I think. Um, so let's see the answers to that. But before we can uh, go there, maybe I'll, I'll ask you, um, you know, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people in general feel awkward about giving praise. I think social care, hopefully we'll see, feels uh, less awkward about it. Um, but should people just suck it up? 
is, is that something that, that we can say? Should people just, like, the benefit of praise are obvious. Should people just be giving praise more frequently um, and be just more generous with it? Adam, what do you think? I thought you were going to steal my word then when you said generous, because I, I was going to say you need to be genuine. You know, if you're oh. going to be disingenuous with your praise and be like, oh, thanks for today, you've done a really good job then, yeah, it is going to be awkward, mean it, you know, and if you are going to praise, why are you praising, understand why you're praising, and understand that recognition, and again, it comes to self-love, if you're not used to praising yourself, if you don't go home every single day and do an affirmation and go, I did this really well today, and I'm really proud of myself, how can you then genuinely talk to somebody else in a in a, a, an affirming way, if you can't affirm yourself, you can't affirm others, so it's it's difficult, I think, there is a case of just being able to suck it up and and give that recognition. But I, again, it has to be with the intent. Otherwise, you'll get your employees going, oh, another pizza party today to say thank you. And they'll be mocking you on social media because actually that's not what they want. You know, it's yeah. just understanding where that rec recognition and that thanks needs to come from. So I would just say, get personal. You know, really yeah. get personal, get to know your team, get to understand them, know their kids, know their routines, know what they do, their likes, their interests, because it makes it so much easier. It makes it so much easier to go, oh, Susan, how's Adam doing at school at the moment? You know, God, he must yeah. be so proud of you, because the work you've done this week has just been fantastic. And in fact, Doris said the other day when you came to see her that it was the best thing that happened all week for it. It's simple. It's genuine. You've acknowledged who she is as a person and her relationship. And you've also backed it up with someone else saying, actually, you've done a really good job. And it's yeah. just something simple like that that matters, but it's got to be genuine. And don't repeat. It's not about doing the same thing constantly. It's not yeah. about using the same method of recognition. Be spontaneous. Be genuine. Love that. Love that. What do you think, uh, Neil? I think yeah, if you look at, you know, where, where are people getting the praise from? I think in social care, you're going to get praise from your clients and residents regardless in most cases. So there's kind of a flow of love. Anyway, it's about the organization trying to build on that. And I agree with the comments about making it specific, if you can. And um, a, a, a nice little tip I saw from the US is um, sort of mandating supervisors to think every day of trying to find somebody to say well done to and record mm. that in a bookmark praise. So you've got the basics of what they did. And then every so often, the manager can write a personal note home. And the purpose of doing that, not only is to kind of crystallize that praise, but also that that note has now entered the family and is going to be shown to partners who may not realize the work, the contribution that person's making to social care. And they might be saying, why aren't you working at Tesco or Amazon's offering three grand bonus? Why are we not doing that? And, and we need to get all the stakeholders on side. And I think the more we can get those family members to support and appreciate the contribution that person's making. And they often have a calling for it, but it can be inconvenient to other people too. If you say, I'm gonna help out by coming in on a Friday night. Well, what happened to the trip to the pub that has now been canceled? So I think there's that piece we need to understand in social care, it's about the whole person. Um, yeah. And research from the New Zealand said that 52% of all care workers, and I bet it's the same here, have alternative family caring responsibilities, be that yeah. kids or older, you know, adults, uh, maybe mum or dad, or they're helping friends out. I see that all the time with care workers. So they're juggling all the time. And I've seen the, in the comments this talk about flexibility. I think it's really important for flexibility for the types of workers we're talking about here, care workers. You know, they're very giving people. And, and the danger on the Teflon point, if you like, of are you going to accept any praise is people always think, oh, no, it's always so I have to put someone else first. It's not about me. And I think that is a problem trying to get the well-being support in because people say don't see themselves or they deny that they need help. There's always someone else they want to prioritize. And I think it's almost a challenge with the types of people we have in the sector. They're too giving yeah. to accept. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, the first thing I'd say is um, uh, just on the, the praising point, and granted, it's a small sample size uh, of, of uh, the people on this webinar, but overwhelmingly, 95% say that they either give praise all the time or they don't really have uh, feel awkward about giving praise. I'm not surprised by that, to be honest. Um, what is interesting is, is we often hear, uh, and again, like our, our research shows that people would uh, like to be appreciated more at work. Um, and I think maybe part of that is uh, the nature of the job is that you're often on the go, you're often on the floor and it's difficult to kind of uh, 
you know, pin someone down and say, you did exemplary work today. If, if, if you can't, you know, have that conversation with them because they are actually, you know, looking after someone at the very time. And so, as you said, Neil, like uh, so, someone that is, uh, you know, keeping a, a, a keeping notes of, of things that were great and kind of going a, a roundabout way of, of giving that praise. Uh, I, I love that idea. Um, I think something along the lines of, of trying to be, very genuine and understanding of, of not just the individual, but also like what their what their day to day is during the job and what they did well and what they what they excelled at is so important. Um, and even to a point where like if you made those notes in your diary uh, at the end of a shift or at the start of the next shift or something like that, and then you know once you had the opportunity to, to kind of give the, the, that feedback. Um, that might not be at the same time. You can you can even text them or, or something like that, or or you can you know give them that feedback you know a few days later. But I'm really, it's it's interesting to me to see here that that um, people's perception is that they give praise all the time, um, but the, the sector still feels certain lack of uh, an appreciation. I think it's better to say our research research showed. But again, it is it it is maybe different to people's perception of what is abundant and and kind of what is regular um, and. Um, as, as a species, we, we seemingly we like like getting praise that is both specific and meaningful to us, and I think uh, it's it's something that is worth reflecting on. Um, right, going more into into kind of steps or of of, of 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 like actionable things that we can do. What do you guys see as the key steps in creating a new culture of recognition programs? Um, and, and have you seen anyone do it really well? And this can be either in, inside organizations or kind of from outside looking in. Uh, and I'll start with you, Neil. Yeah, I mean, so the, this obviously needs to come from the top. Uh, I'm sure Adam's going to say a similar thing. And it, it, if you look at the, there's a movement in the US called servant leadership. And uh, I guess it might be called here compassionate leadership. So Michael West being a good proponent of this very fascinating book, if you if you get the chance to read it, is about how can we as leaders create this culture where people have the permission to talk about things like this, and they and uh, they feel you know that mistakes are not going to be told, uh, you know, kind of to, um, picked up on too much, and there, there's a support. And I think that you know the culture or the, of say um, of inspection can is negative to this. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but it's very much like you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. And, you know, we lose role autonomy. And I think we have to try and, you know, be sensible here about how we can create an environment. How can we improve the job quality? And so leadership is one thing I mentioned as well. I think we don't do enough soft skills training. And um, I found this research on soft skills. Again, it was a rooting around in the US. And I found this fascinating kind of coaching supervision work. And just by reading the, the examples in the worksheet, it improved my relationship with my son because I picked up these and often it was a conflicted relationship. But I thought, oh, hang on, I'm going to not just jump to a conclusion anymore. I'm going to listen and try and understand. And as those of you on the call might have, take, for example, someone turns up late. They're late three times this week. And you might think, not happy about that. I'm going to I'm going to have to talk to them. But what if you yeah. knew that they were caring for their mum who was wouldn't yeah. let them leave? And then they're battling this guilt between the two things. Now, if you knew that you would take a different view. So I think it, yeah. it's very much about learning about the whole person and the types of people we have and that how they're psychologically made up. I think, you know, a lot of it is about that. But I'm sure Adam's going to uh, come up with some great alternative points. Go on, Adam. I, well, I mean, I agree. Leadership top down, recognition top down. But I also think we need cross leadership. I think we need cross recognition. Um, so I, I did a talk recently um, for, for Majestic Care, actually, as part of the Care and View. And I asked everyone in the room, because it was all of our staff from all angles of the company, how many of you believe yourself to be a leader? And I think the managers put their hands up. I was like, no, no, I didn't say manager. How many of you believe yourself to be a leader? And actually, every single person in an organization will be a leader at some point during the day. At any day, if your domestic team come in and go, actually, can you help me just sort this room out? I'm going to do this. You need to do it like this. You're leading somebody in a task. If you're caring for someone and there's two people doing so, one person takes the lead, you're leading. So we need to be able to, as a team, recognize each other as well. We're always, you know, finding it easy to go into the break room and go, oh, gosh, she's coming today. And God, have you seen what she's done with her hair? And, you know, she's not done this properly. And, oh, she didn't do that last night when she finished a shift. But how many of us find it really easy to go, thank you for, I don't know, 
taking on that extra five minutes this morning pre-handover. You know, simple things like that. So we need to be able to encourage our teams to thank each other and recognise each other. You don't have to go as twee as sitting around in a circle and go, one thing I like about Dave is, but <laughs> it's, it's a thing you can do. If your team really do struggle to communicate with each other and do not yeah. get along, sit them down. You know, let's engage as people. But Neil's right. Is you've got to understand the whole picture. I would say start looking at your um, complaints culture. I can't stand um, regulation the way that it acts at the moment. I don't like how it's worded. I don't like how people approach it. I don't like that when the inspection comes around, they go, can I have a look at your complaints folder? Because when I was a manager, I was like, no, you can't. You can have a look at my compliments with complaints, but you're not having a look at my complaints folder because I don't just have a complaints folder. We encourage either or and both. So we used to call it highlights and lowlights. If you're going to come with me uh, with a low light, I've really not enjoyed this today or this doesn't work well. I'll be like, right, fine, I'm going to listen to it. But what is working well? What are you enjoying at the moment? What is going well? Because you need to be able to balance it and we need to recognize that good things are happening. And just be on top, be on top of it all the time. Don't let things build up like a game of Buckaroo and everything just crumbles be open, be looking all the time. It's really simple. Just usher in that that feedback, positive culture. But I will say, Ollie, and this is no nothing against what you're saying, I would also say safeguard your communication times as well. I wouldn't hmm. be recommending texting yeah. someone at 11 o'clock at yeah. night going, oh, you had a really good job today. Because similarly, yeah. like what Neil was saying about rushing into work and being five minutes late, they may have a newborn kid that actually is fast asleep and that text wakes them up and they go, well, it's fine that you said that I've done a good job, but I'm going to have a sleepless night now. So it's about understanding those boundaries of communication as well. Let them have their days off. Let them have that time off and, yeah. and thank them when they're in work, you know, when it matters and when it means most, when they're leaving, when they get in, but allow them to have that time as well because that is recognising that they deserve it. Yeah, it's it's interesting. and we, We've done some work on this internally in terms of uh, building a product that, that allows for some recognition, but also doesn't, like exactly like you said, Adam, like doesn't, bother them on their day off or in their in, in their evenings but instead allows them to kind of do like check the app or, or check the the technology themselves at a time that is convenient to them you know on their way into work or whatever it might be when they're not engaged in something else uh and give that little bit of, of you know boost uh, to their morale at the at the correct time and it's, it's silly sometimes but it, it does tend to work um quite a bit well and and i even even if it is even if it is a, a text message or or uh, I say a text message, but even if it is through through digital communications, it actually does have a meaningful impact because if the result is you didn't actually do um, if by not doing it through digital means, you wouldn't have done it at all. Well, digital means is better. I think it, in person, let's be honest, is is way better uh, and, and and in person and um, you know tailored to to that individual is way better than something generic uh, digitally. And that's that's not something that, that, I, that I think um, anyone should be promoting. It's funny that you said Majestic Care. I just want to give a shout out to them, by the way. Um, they uh, they uh, do uh, Majestic Care Star Awards, which I think is a fantastic initiative. Um, they allow people to nominate. And this is again, why is this? Why is this like you could have a cynical view on something like this? You have like some award ceremony uh, within your within your company. But the reason it works and resonates is because you're being nominated by the people that you work with on a day to day basis. And so you, like that brings the kind of authenticity to the entire entire process. And that's why it works, I think, really, really well. We've seen it. Um, we've seen their, their Majestic Your Star Awards uh, in, in action. And I thought it was just such a cool thing to, to witness. Uh, and so huge shout out to, to Majestic Your on that front. Um, <laughs> right. Getting kind of like closer to the end, and we want to make sure that we leave some room for for questions. Um, maybe kind of in terms of uh, a, the last formal question before we move on to Q and A. Um, if you had one thing that our viewers could do right now to kind of get the ball rolling on within their organizations, I, and like I, I'm making the assumption that most of these uh, the, the people on the webinar are not from from the kind of national government, but actually from the organizations or, around the around the country struggling with this stuff like what what should they do to get the ball rolling on it and maybe i'll start with you this time adam just ask your team whether you're doing things right it's very simple if you if you're attending this and you're wanting to know about recognition 
chances are either you're not being recognized, you are recognizing people, but you want to do more, or you've got a problem within your organization. You know, we don't attend learning seminars for the the, the sake of it, especially when everyone's time poor. So I'm not going to call anybody out and say that you're, you're poor at what you're doing. I don't mean that at all, but subconsciously, there must be something you're needing to get from this. So simply, I would just go to your team and go, do you feel recognized here? Are we supporting you? Do you feel comfortable and safe? Go from there. Start from there. Don't presume to know. Ask. Love that, Neil. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good. I, 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 I was hoping I'd go first, then Adam wouldn't say something. Like <laughs> so uh, I'm okay. I'm going to think of something. I mean, I would uh, definitely, uh, if you look at the staff turnover statistics, and I realise there's much more to it than that. They are clustered heavily in the first 12 weeks of employment. So how we set the tone here is really important. So I think the boss has a role to welcome personally every new starter and say, thank you for choosing this company and welcome to the company. And I think that sets the scene and buys you credits. I mean, hopefully you won't need to use them, but I think we have a big problem with people leaving very quickly. And that's because we don't set the tone properly. People might turn up and it's a super busy time. And I've seen people saying, oh, just sit there for a while and then they get forgotten. So I think the boss has a role there. And then at the other end of the scale, the boss has a role. If someone hands in their notice, or says they're going to leave often it's one tiny thing that's just tipped them over the edge and with the boss saying is there anything we can do that's quite a respectful you know you can resolve those tiny issues sometimes that are make unnecessary uh you know uh, staff loss so i think the role you know, we talked about compassionate leadership and it's great to see people putting uh, michael west link in links in the in the chat there so i think i would say the role of the boss there to to both set the scene and rescue people uh, and by the way if they've left of course if you do ask them to come back then about a third do uh, because they do find sometimes outside of social care if that's where they're going uh, is not as friendly and familial as as uh, it is, and we often often forget in social care that we're really quite privileged to be here. Yeah, and outside of social care, oftentimes you're also not working towards, you know, you're not you're not making a good, if that makes sense, or, or like you're not working towards your vocation. I think that's the the obvious obvious call, calling back card. Um, yeah. Can I just that say is, I fully support sure. what Neil's just said. Like I 100% believe that that is essential. If you are a manager of a service, it's essential. When I was a manager, one of the things I would ask a new star is, "How long have I got you for? Mm. What is your end game? What do you want to do? What do you want to achieve? How do I help you do it?" Because if you can tell them from day one, you're going to support them on their journey. They're going to go, "Oh, actually, maybe I'm going to achieve good stuff here." And if you know that they're going to go in four years' time, three and a half years later, start recruiting. Because you know that you've trained them up, they'll benefit your business while you're supporting them, and then yeah. you've replaced them once they've gone. So I 100% agree with what Neil said, probably more so than what I've said. Just, yeah, it's, it's so essential that. Yeah, and, and it's actually quite interesting that you, you said at some point during the conversation, Neil, as well, that you know, oftentimes you find that people don't leave the sector, but leave to go down, you know, down the road or something like that. And so I think there's something about opening, like making sure that you do what good managers do which is opening up that communication like early and frequently so that if you, people feel unsupported or if they feel, oftentimes they're not even big things. Oftentimes they're small things that accumulate over time, but you want to be listened and want to be heard on those, those things. And I, I find it really interesting that good managers oftentimes if, like are not making big sweeping moves, but like they're just making sure that they clear the clutter on a regular basis. And I, yeah, it's, and I, it's, it's yeah, very just, important. I think. Just on that point, Ollie, and uh, uh, Adam was talking about communication as well. I think communication has massively improved during COVID because it had to, because often we yeah. didn't have the ability, especially if our staff aren't on site, we're home care or something. But the communication tended to be one way, transmit stuff and not two way. And I think there's another idea I found from somewhere in the world uh, was what's called a Friday phone call. So you just like connect with somebody and say, how's it going? And then shut up and listen and not say, by the way, there's these things you need to be doing. And because I think the, the danger for managers is that we, we have so much coming into us that needs disseminating and there's all of this stuff and you don't give people a voice uh, and they need a voice. Wow. Did that sound basic? Friday phone call and just like ask how they're doing and and and, and listen. Yeah, it's basic, but it's 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 one that like doesn't happen nearly enough. I think that's actually like such a good nucleus. Like it's it's yeah. it's just how you're doing. Silence. It was it was actually called the Friday love in, but I didn't want to say that on a <laughs> because <laughs> that'll take <laughs> well, a whole other route. 
uh, and my call comes up on Friday. So no, I think um, I think yeah, Friday phone call or if they're on site, just a little bit of quiet time with them is a is yeah. a really important thing. And when was the last time you did that? Because I think you need to understand what's going on in their lives. You know, often there's a lot of challenge in people's lives: childcare challenges, transport challenges, relationships, healthcare, all of these things going on. And and you know, I think social care is about, as I say, the whole person and. It's not just a job you turn up to swap your time for money. It's much yeah. more. Actually, uh, and, and now we can move on to some some of the questions. Uh, Susan, actually, and this this goes directly, I think, to to how you support people and 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 you know to go go beyond just kind of saying good job. Uh, she asks uh, specifically in uh, learning disability services, care staff can face the physical aggression, which makes it uh, difficult for staff to recommend it to their family and friends. It's part of the job, and we provide counseling and physio. Um, but are there any other ideas? Um, who wants to take that one? I, um, I, I, I would say, yeah, we do hear of cases. Say, for example, I've heard cases where someone's working uh, and they're picking up bruises uh, regularly, mm. and then the partner doesn't want to take them out in, uh, in case someone says, oh, you, how did they get those bruises? Uh, you know, yeah. So I, I do completely accept that there are challenges. What I think the secret here is other staff. So we see from, so for example, like employee referral, you know, you can manage the sort of personal care challenging behavior bit because someone who's actually in the job says, look, it's not that bad. It's part of the job, but here's all the rewards to it. So in yeah. service, I would say peer mentoring or buddying, because this problem that Susan's describing is, you know, could well be early stages of employment, really. Do, do I, I, you know, I, am I prepared to do this job? And I think peer mentoring is a really powerful way of providing a, a support structure around the person on the same level so they can ask questions and, you know, someone who's doing the job as well. So that's what I would suggest. Amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one, really. I mean, I've never worked in learning disabilities myself, but I have worked with, you know, advanced dementia and, and EDI and it is a difficult thing. And, and this is, again, I, I don't want to, this is just my opinion. I, I always try and steer away from it's part of the job because physical aggression and physical violence against staff should never be just universally mm. accepted. We should mm. never as an organisation go, oh, it's just part of the job. I think there has to be some internal work. We can do a lot of it is government. We need the funding. But we need to be having a look at ways in which we can say to people, look, we are going to offer you physio. We are going to offer you counselling. What mm. training do you need? What can we do more as an organisation to maybe reduce this? Do we work with the families and you at the same time? Is there anything we can do to make you feel supportive? Because if they go away from that going, actually, I know 100% of the time it's not going to happen. But when it does, I've got the support there and I've got the team to talk to and I've got the options to be able to go, actually, I think I need this to be able to achieve it in a safer way. I think that will benefit them. So just be honest with them and go, look, we know this is a really naff part of the role and we, we want to work to reduce it. So how can we do that? How can we reduce those behaviours that appear and present as challenging and, and as aggressive? And what more can we do to to support you in that way? So it's, it's yeah. a difficult one. And I think it's one that the government needs to answer with their social care reforms in 2025 because they won't do anything until then. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, this is kind of like we've gone from from appreciation and recognition to to real support, haven't we? Like it, it's it's a spectrum, uh, like from from end to end. And yeah, great answers, guys. Um, guy, kind of going on the next one. Do you think that this is from Pandora in the Q and A? Do you think that communication styles uh, need to be taken into consideration when creating a a recognition program? Uh, I some people need words of praise to stay motivated and others don't necessarily care for words and more actions like receiving a certificate or a badge or something like that are more important. Um, yeah, and I, can I just add on to that as well, that we also need to think about our generations? Because if you're going to phone a Gen Z and say, you know, really well done on your job today, they're not going to pick the phone up. Millennials don't like picking the phone up. I'm a millennial and I don't answer the door if I'm not expecting a parcel delivery or postman. <laughs> You know, so we've got to understand the demographics that we're dealing with as well. So it's, you know, it's understanding what's going to benefit them. Some people might just like a card or a letter as a, as a sort of thank you. Some people might be living in the bedroom at the parents' house and have nowhere to display that. And actually, a voucher might be something that would benefit them better or a, an email or a digital certificate, something similar. So, again, it's just about asking your team and going, what would matter to you? If you know, you know, this is going to be our recognition program, you get to choose how we recognize you, what would what would benefit you, what would mean the most to you? Yeah. Neil? 
Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, uh, you know, it's uh, the generations have changed. I mean, the, t the chat on the earlier about flexibility is really, you know, a lot being driven by younger generations saying, well, I'm doing all these different things and I want care work to fit into my life. And, and we mm. can't just have the same shift patterns and so on. But uh, I think it's important to make a distinction between recognition and appreciation and trying to understand yeah. the tools in your toolbox, because a quiet word of thanks you know, is not the same as, you know, being put in the newsletter or being given employee of the month or whatever. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, it, it can surprise you what really matters to people. Um, and I remember research I read where staff said, you know, even a branded fleece or something in the winter or just if you're in home care, you know, kind of de-icer, thinking about, yeah. thinking about, you know, the, how we can help you in your work. Just the, the yeah. very thought of that. And the more you know about the person, uh, and their motivations, the more you can tailor that to, ex to be very thoughtful and not just something, as Adam says, that's a generic thing. But um, certainly some people would find it very awkward to be brought out in front of everyone, round of applause. You know, their toes will be curling and we might do damage. <laughs> yeah. so it's free to, you know, and I've heard home care providers particularly say, oh, my goodness, I, I put on like a pizza evening and the same people turn up and the others won't engage at all. Well, I think the fact yeah. that they've been invited, you know, that's enough. Some people are loners or want to just do the job and uh, don't want to engage and that needs to be respected but but yeah. we can obviously do more just it's not shouldn't be forced fun um people should choose how much they want to they want to engage yeah and they might have other obligations or, or things they need to do outside of work right and again it's about understanding the whole per person i think is, is is what you said i totally agree with that um we've we've seen like organizations that are successful at this stuff i think um and you've both kind of touched on on, on flavors of this our organizations that on kind of as a first step try to figure out like where they are currently in on their recognition journey if, if there's anything being done or like is it being successful and what are the success criteria i guess but then actually going and asking the people in the organization how would you like to be recognized and and not necessarily doing a a one kind of solution fits all but actually trying to figure out you know does someone want a, a quiet word of, of you know a thank you or does someone actually want to be recognized more widely um either within the organization or even outside of the organization um and so i think probably both are needed uh, i think like you, you can't do do it without um like you get to a certain size at the very least where, where you absolutely have to do both to kind of cater for, for both type of in individuals and both type of, of desires i think mm. um yeah anything uh, Adam, you were about to say something? No, I was just going to add to that, and, and and I'm not doing your job for you, but it sort of links into what Ira's asked in the questions as well. You know, with, with Pandora asking about receiving a certificate or badge, and Ira asking about how we do this without um, costing a fortune. One thing that we can all agree is the public need to recognise social care more, and we need our local communities to recognise them more. There is nothing wrong in phoning around your local shops and going, oh, by the way, I'm doing a recognition programme for my yeah. social care team. Do you want to donate a prize? Because it's going to go towards this, and they're going to be recognised for this, et cetera, et cetera ask people don't be shy you know people will lay down golden roads and rainbow flags for the nhs it's about time we start cashing in some of those checks now for social care so don't be afraid to ask people to contribute you know be honest about it and go look we really want to recognize people and it would be great if we could have you uh, donate an award and we'll tell people about your shop etc 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 quid pro quo do it amazing amazing such a good such good like suggestions and thoughts um I think we are arriving at a, I don't think we have more time for, for further questions. And so I wanted to say before we leave, and you have to think, I hope you take it in the spirit that is intended that Neil and Adam, I really appreciate you having been here <laughs> with me on this webinar. Um, but uh, on, on, on a serious note, um, I want to give you both an opportunity to, to um, you know, um, say goodbye and, and uh, a shout out if, if anything uh, that you want to shout out uh, by all means and I want to thank everyone that joined us here today but over to you I guess first Adam and then, and then Neil Well I just thank you for continuing to work in social care is all I can really say you know thank you for showing up thank you for wanting to do more and be more and achieve more and thank you for wanting to support your teams you know, I, I looked out, I got a different role, so I don't work directly on, on the front line, as it will. I don't like the term front line. It feels like a war, and I, we're not fighting a war. Agreed. You know, yeah. make love, not war. That's what we're trying to do. But it's just a huge thank you to everyone still yeah. going strong and, and making social care the fabulous place it is. 
No, I mean, I think, yeah, yet again, Adam's stolen my thunder. Thanks, Adam. If you could have an agreement next time. <laughs> yeah, so whatever he said there, um, I, I, I would say certainly we, we should um, not underestimate the value of what of what we're doing to society. And if we've chosen people well, if we've recruited for values, then we have a very, very special group of people. So you're already in a good place. And I think those of us that have come on this webinar are, are obviously interested in this topic and already halfway down the road because or probably fully down the road because they they realize the importance of this i think one of the challenges is getting the word out to all of social care some of these organizations can be very inward looking and it's such a shame because there's yeah. uh, obviously forums like this there's forums like i saw mark tops and others on the uh, uh call you know have great kind of podcasts there's a lot of support adams is a great example i think people need to get more involved in that and and get all we can all get support from each other uh and so uh, and no you know it's really so important now uh, so yeah thank you for coming along amazing i don't think uh well on that note i think i will just end it because this was very well said neil thank you neil thank you adam um thank you for everyone that joined us today look out for the next one uh, in february and uh, you will receive some uh, emails with, with some further content that will be hopefully helpful to you and your organization with regards to recognition and appreciation. Thank you, everyone. See you later. Bye-bye.